A Link to the Past randomizer. While the concept may seem simple on the surface, looking a little deeper shows that it can become oh so much more complex. Even when just going to generate a seed, you are presented with so many different options and modes. From preset rules, such as the default rule set, to the various different modes such as standard, open, or even inverted. Today I would like to describe each mode of play in more detail to alleviate some of the confusion caused by having so many options. Hopefully this will help those new or experienced with the randomizer choose what sounds most appealing to them. Alright, let's start things off as simply as possible by looking into the most basic of modes, Standard. This also happens to be the mode selected in the beginner preset. Standard is the mode that strays the least from the vanilla game's original flow. You start off by rescuing Princess Zelda from Hyrule Castle's dungeon, save the Seven Maidens, and conquer Ganon's tower to take on the pig himself. Unless you choose to do otherwise, this mode only shuffles the game's items around, and it's up to you to solve the puzzle of how to find each item you need to complete the game. Every mode that you can choose for the randomizer has its own set of pros and cons. I wish to go over these for each mode discussed today. For standard, these should not be too surprising. The pros are, standard is easy to pick up and play, even for new players. The run through Hyrule Castle at the start generally gets you some basic resources, such as rupees and bombs, to help you once you've finished it. You'll always receive some form of weapon from Link's uncle, allowing you to defend yourself right off the bat. Some randomness in regards to your starting route is eased, because you'll always start from Hyrule Castle, since it's good for races sometimes. The cons, however... The final three chests of the sewers may be inaccessible if you do not receive a bomb or the Pegasus boots during the Hyrule Castle portion, leading to the possibility that you have to come back and run through the sewers a second time to obtain these. The simplicity of the mode is a double-edged sword, and seeds may lack variety after several have been played. This samey feel partially defeats the purpose of a randomizer to begin with. Open mode is very similar to standard, but with a couple of key differences. You start the game as though Princess Zelda has already been rescued, allowing you to start from either Link's house or the Sanctuary. This change allows a little more creativity at the start of the game, but it comes at the cost of Hyrule Castle being something you have to choose whether or not to clear at some point. Unsurprisingly, open mode's pros and cons are very similar to standards as well. The pros are, it is still quite simple overall, so it remains beginner-friendly. Not being forced to start with Hyrule Castle also allows for a little more variety at the start of the seed. The cons, however, your initial resources such as bombs and rupees are harder to come across before you need them. This can lead to rupee farming or backtracking to places where you needed a bomb. With open being so similar to standard, the same issue with seeds eventually becoming samey still applies. Next up, we have Keysanity. While there are multiple options under Dungeon Item Shuffle, Keysanity is, traditionally, the one used most often. It does precisely as it says, and shuffles dungeon items such as maps, compasses, small keys and big keys, into the item pool so you can find them anywhere in the game. This comes with a plethora of little nuances that I'll delve into right now in order to make this mode a little less overwhelming to dive into. The first thing to note is the importance of knowing how many small keys a dungeon requires in order to be completed. Most trackers will tell you a dungeon's total number of small keys, so finding out how many you truly need comes with experience. Some examples of this include, for Swamp Palace, there is only one small key to find, but is required to get past the very first room, while for Palace of Darkness and Skull Woods, you can get away with finding as little as one and zero small keys respectively. Next up, while what the various keys do is self-explanatory, the maps and compasses of each dungeon are another story entirely. Whenever you select some form of dungeon item shuffle, the game will no longer tell you if a dungeon is a pendant or a crystal until you find the dungeon's map. If you have the game's music on, the dungeon music is even randomized so you cannot rely on that either. This makes maps, especially maps to pendant dungeons, have some purpose. Compasses, on the other hand, still serve very little purpose. When you are in a dungeon where you have its compass, a counter will display showing the number of chests you have opened versus the total number of chests in the dungeon. Good for first-time players, but fairly useless otherwise. 
Now, there's actually an exception when it comes to the information about a dungeon being a pendant or a crystal. Throughout the game, there are two NPCs that will give you information about the Pendant of Courage and Crystals 5 and 6, respectively. First up is Sahasrila, who tells you which dungeon has the green pendant, or Pendant of Courage, as he gives you an item if you talk to him with it in your possession. This is how you receive the Pegasus Boots in the vanilla game. Next is the Bomb Salesman from the Bomb Shop in the Dark World. When you visit the shop with Crystals 5 and 6 in your possession, a giant bomb will be purchasable, granting you access to the cracked entrance at the Pyramid. Conveniently, your map will update with the information received from these NPCs as well. Overall, Keysanity adds a little extra flair to the usual open mode style of game if played on its own. Make sure to use a map tracker with a key sanity setting to help you understand where you can go using the keys in your possession. Do not forget that the two chests in Agatum's Tower exist! Key sanity works especially nicely when paired with other, more complex modes, but we'll get into that momentarily. For now, the pros and cons of key sanity on its own. First up, the pros for key sanity. Adding all the dungeon items to the pool adds uncertainty and variance that can lead to new situations very different from simpler modes. The mode's complexity is also still relatively low, especially with the assistance of a map-based tracker. This makes Keysanity a good choice when looking for just a little more overall complexity. Keys lead to more interesting decisions in terms of where to go, leaving more room for skillful decision-making to come out on top in a race. The cons are actually a little bit of a double-edged sword. Some dungeons, most notably Turtle Rock, become extremely tedious if you need to visit them multiple times. Having to spend minutes returning to where you were in a dungeon with one or two more keys is never a good feeling. Without something attached to it, Kisandi also feels a bit like just an open and standard seed with extra hoops to jump through rather than something entirely different. Without really changing up the way the game's played, sometimes Kisandi just isn't enough on its own. Before moving on to any even more complex modes, I want to briefly talk about the Super Quick preset. This preset makes use of the ability to reduce the number of crystals needed to defeat Ganon, as well as pre-opening the hole on top of the pyramid to theoretically make a seed that can be completed very quickly. You actually require very few items in order to defeat Ganon. Gather up two swords, either the lamp or the fire rod, and some way to enter the Dark World with the Moon Pearl, and you're good to go provided you survive the fight. This is made even easier by the Super Quick preset starting you with one sword, so you only need to find one more. Now the true struggle in this mode is the Ganon fight itself. Most of the time when you finish a seed, you will have a comfortable amount of hearts and other safety items to assist you in the fight. Whereas in Super Quick, the seed generally does not last long enough to allow much more than the bare minimum equipment. Fighting Ganon with just the Master Sword is not easy. And while there are tricks, such as clever use of the Cane of Samaria, to make it faster, it is completely up to you to dodge his barrages of tridents and firebats. What makes this even worse is you will almost always be fighting Ganon without the Silver Arrows, provided you know how to. With the Master Sword, the final phase takes a great deal of time, and if you also only have the Fire Rod alongside it instead of the Lamp, you realistically will need a Magic Potion, or Half Magic, in order to slip in enough spin attacks before you run out of shots. Simple as Ganon is essentially abusing both the fact that the right torch will never go out if you light the left one right after it goes out the first time, and the brief vulnerability period Ganon has at the start of his teleports to consistently damage Ganon without the silver arrows. When it comes to the pros and cons of Super Quick, it is as simple as its nature. For the pros, seeds can end up being, well, super quick. This makes this preset a good option if you have limited time available. There's also a high chance of fighting Ganon with poor equipment, making this an ideal preset if you wish to practice some tough Ganon fights. For the cons, while the seeds can be super quick, they can also become quite long if the game refuses to hand over another sword or a fire source. This can lead to some extreme variance in the seed lengths. If you're not comfortable with Silverless Ganon and other poor equipment strategies, you will most likely die, die, and die some more to the pig. Animizer. Oh, Animizer. Alright, so personal bias is going to shine through very badly for this one, as Animizer is by far my least favorite of the options available for randomization. 
On paper, it seems fine! Randomize the game's enemies so you can walk into a room and end up in a wacky situation. But in practice, it tends to be quite a headache, especially if you start randomizing enemy damage and health. Enemy health is self-explanatory. Enemies often end up very tanky, and killing them with anything but a one-hit KO weakness becomes very tedious. But damage! Oh my goodness, damage. So here's the thing about damage in A Link to the Past. Most enemies really do not do a lot. Half a heart, a whole heart, sometimes maybe two. But add damage randomization in there, and suddenly very frustrating enemies or obstacles can do four hearts or more! If you go full chaos, they can even do up to eight! Combine this with frankly ridiculous room layouts, and occasionally even forced damage scenarios, and you get a right mess. I wish I could say that was it, but then there is also the option to randomize bosses. At first this seems like it could be worth a laugh, as you could get bamboozled at the end of each dungeon. But unfortunately, it couples poorly with A Link to the Past dungeon design. Many of the game's dungeons have a long, linear path in order to reach the boss room. This is especially prevalent in Misery Mire and Ice Palace. While under normal circumstances, this is fine, as you know you can defeat the boss, once you randomize said bosses, things can take a turn for the frustrating. The reason this is such an issue is due to the bosses Argus, Cold Stare, and Trinex. All three of these bosses require a unique item to defeat. For Argus, you need the Hookshot. For Cold Stare, either the Fire Rod or Bombos. And for Trinex, you need both the Fire Rod and the Ice Rod. Having to retread these long paths to the boss just because it was one of the few you cannot defeat gets annoying pretty quickly. Especially if you set boss shuffle to fully random, allowing multiples of each boss per seed. Still though, should you choose to play this mode, I do wish to address one nuance in regards to its logic. In Eastern Palace, Palace of Darkness, and Ganon's Tower, there are rooms with enemies only vulnerable to the bow that you must defeat. In Enemizer, these enemies are always shuffled to be simpler enemies that can be defeated with a sword, bombs, or other simple weapon. This means, for example, the logic no longer expects you to have a bow to reach Eastern Palace's boss fight. Alright, so the pros and cons are more of a summary this time, but... For the pros, Animizer's good for a laugh if you're in a mood for its particular brand of ridiculous. And while debatably unfair about it, Animizer can also make for a more challenging seed when you mess about with the enemy damage settings. Animizer's also a perfect fit for if you're getting tired of the same old muscle memory from room to room, because the different enemy layouts force you to do different things. For the cons, many settings combinations can feel unfair, frustrating, or straight-up tedious. Trinex! Trinex everywhere! Boss Shuffle itself is also laughable in a race format due to the aforementioned Trinex everywhere, amongst other things. And do not combine Animizer with a standard world state, or you will most likely be having yourself a bad time. Time for one of the more interesting game modes, Inverted! This mode is pretty much what it says on the tin. The rules between the light world and the dark world are reversed. Your starting point is instead in the dark world, and you need the moon pearl to maintain your form in the light world instead. While the mid and late game of Inverted feel similar to other modes, the early game is radically different and can lead to many difficult scenarios that other modes cannot quite prepare you for. The early danger makes Inverted a good choice for players with a little more experience looking for something new. There are a few peculiar situations to quickly address here. First off, the towers for Aghanim and Ganon have swapped places. You can now reach the light world by defeating Aghanim thanks to a handy set of stairs. Next, the mirror is now used to go from the light world to the dark world instead of vice versa. To accommodate this, the map has been modified so light world locations that require the mirror no longer need it. Instead, the mirror can be used for strange new purposes, such as entering Misery Mire, and even going through Turtle Rock backwards. The Ocarina has also had its rules swapped. While you still activate it at the center of Kakariko Village, the Ocarina itself is now used in the Dark World to take you to similar points on the map. This gives another option for reaching Misery Mire other than the mirror. Supposedly, the Ocarina's functionality is receiving an update in future versions, however, such as activating it from the Dark World, so this information may eventually become outdated. 
The big obstacle with Inverta is that sometimes you'll be asked to defeat one or more of the Dark World bosses with very minimal equipment in order to reach the Light World. Commonly this ends up being Blind or Mothula, but sometimes you can even be expected to defeat Cold Stare or Hellsor King too! Brace yourself when the time eventually comes. You may die a few times before pulling out that much-earned victory. One last quick note. The shop just east of Link's new house has been updated to sell blue potions. These are in case something important is in Spike Cave, or if you need extra help against the tougher bosses. While there are still more niche situations to discuss, for the sake of brevity I will leave a few surprises. Now for Inverted's pros, the radically different early game can lead to some tense but fun situations that can make a seat exciting right off the bat. The item functionality changes let you use navigation tools like the mirror and ocarina in creative new ways. And the same equip point for having defeated Agadum and having the mirror ends up being extremely useful. For the cons, however, the early game resource grind for bombs and rupees is absolutely miserable. Once you get your first rupees, you can abuse the archery game for cash, but every method is painfully slow. Death Mountain is true misery! Reaching the Tower of Hera and the caves on the east takes forever, and you may have to climb several times to finish them all. The early game can also be very demanding and lead to frustrating death after death if you're not prepared. Time to start off the big ones. The remaining game modes are only recommended for very experienced players due to their steep overall learning curve, which slides nicely into Overworld Glitches. Overworld Glitches, or OWG, has a logic that expects you to fully abuse many specific glitches that can be performed in the overworld, letting you reach just about anywhere with just a sword, boots, and a moon pearl. In order to accommodate immediate nonsense, you're even given the Pegasus boots right off the bat. Overworld glitches can be a pretty fun way to spice things up if you're tired of the same old rule sets. Plus, if you're not racing, you could even be tempted to use a few when playing more casual seeds too. The sheer number of glitches that you should know how to do in order to finish one of these seeds is pretty intense. So once again, for brevity, I will list off a few essentials and further link a database for glitch tutorials in the description below to get you started. Alright, for reference you should at least start with the following. Basic boots warping by clipping into walls. Ascending Death Mountain with just the boots. Falling up Death Mountain to Tower of Hera. Reaching East Death Mountain in both the Light and Dark World with minimal equipment. At least one or two ways of getting to the rest of the Dark World from Dark Death Mountain. And clipping into Ganon's Tower. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to glitches, however. So if this mode interests you, definitely do some digging and try out whatever you can. Have some fun with it! Alright, keeping things to the point. The pros of overworld glitches. It can feel like a breath of fresh air after sticking to a more normal rule set with most other modes. You get to witness some of the wacky ways that Link to the Past can break apart at the seams. And you learn fun little shortcuts that you can use during casual runs in the future. Now the cons there are fairly obvious. The steep learning curve in order to be able to even complete a seed can turn away many new players. Having the whole world open with so little turns the whole experience into a wild goose chase as items now lock far fewer locations. And seeds are frequently quite samey due to so few items unlocking significant portions of the world. The next up is my personal favorite, cross keys. This is where we delve into Entrance Randomizer, which does exactly as it says, randomizes every door you can enter all around the world to varying intensities. Crosskeys uses the Crossworld version of Entrance Shuffle, which makes it so if you enter a door and at least a Hyrule Castle, one of the other exits can take you between the Light and Dark Worlds. This goes for all other caves and dungeons with multiple exits too. This, combined with full key sanity discussed earlier, creates a highly varied mode that can lead to utterly ridiculous item chains. While Cross Keys does not have as steep of a learning curve as the likes of Overworld glitches, there are still several unique situations that may be very confusing upon first encountering them. A good example of this is going through a cave in the Light World, going out the other side to end up in the Dark World, then being required to walk around in bunny form to find another connecting cave to get back to a different portion of the light world. This combined with having to use the mirror on the other end of several different connecting caves gives the game plenty of options to confuse the heck out of you. Cross keys is pretty much the go-to option if you're looking for something that will feel significantly different every run. 
If you battle through the initial confusion and start to understand it, it becomes a far smoother experience. One thing that will help with this is a proper tracker. Being able to figure out what is where at a glance is extremely important, so I recommend Seth's entrance tracker to help you out. It'll be linked in the description below. This tracker lets you pin icons onto the map to represent important caves, dungeons, and the like. Feel free to use the pins however you like, as long as it makes sense to you. So for cross keys, the pros are... Each seed tends to be highly unique, resulting in a much more replayable experience. There's substantial room for developed skill, both in terms of gameplay and routing, such a confusing mess to give you the edge in races. Seeds can reach a point of ridiculousness that becomes absolutely hilarious when trying to connect all the dots after the fact. And well, um, I like it a lot. But as for the cons, uh, finding your way around can be very difficult for the first few seeds due to the confusing nature of entrance. The seeds can drag on for a long time, especially if you're not comfortable with them. Multiple play sessions may be needed. And the awkward early game situations may lead to deaths at very frustrating moments, especially if being forced to navigate the dark world as a bunny. Do you like suffering? Then Nightmare Mode is the preset for you. There's not much to say beyond it essentially being what happens when you change almost all of the randomizer's options to be as cruel as possible. Here's some highlights for you. It uses the most confusing form of entrance shuffle. It is inverted mode, so you start in the dark world, sort of. Enemies are randomized and very buffed up. You will never find a sword and instead have to rely on the hammer. Potions barely heal you and barely grant any magic. You cannot catch fairies. And the boomerangs and hookshot no longer stun enemies. And that's only the start of it! When it comes to the Insanity Entrance Shuffle, what this does is, it makes it so you are no longer guaranteed to come out the same entrance you came in from. So you can enter a door in Kakariko Village, but then when you leave, you're at the entrance to Swamp Palace, despite leaving from the same door! Good luck taking coherent notes with that one! Let me break this down to you in a way that gets right to the point. The pros? Suffering! The cons? None! You asked for this! Nice and clear, yeah? Alright, so the last game mode I want to talk about today is the Door Randomizer. This takes the confusion to a whole new level by randomizing the game's dungeon layouts by jumbling up all the rooms across each dungeon. Much like with Entrance, there are different levels of intensity, but it is able to seamlessly mix and match rooms from entirely separate dungeons to form a whole new one. It even randomizes doors by unlocking them, or locking them via a small key or bombable wall. This mode, at the time of recording, is currently experimental and requires a separate program to even make seeds for it, but it can be quite fun if you wish to break your brain for a while. In order to help alleviate some of the frustrations of getting lost in a dungeon, the game starts you off with a map item that acts like the mirror when inside dungeons, thus warping you back to the entrance of them. A common way of integrating the door randomizer is by combining it with the previously mentioned cross key style of seed to make about as crazy of an experience as can be managed at present. This combination of cross keys and door randomizer has been aptly dubbed crisscross and is the form of seed I've been trying out myself. Let me give you a couple of quick nuances just to get you started. The sanctuary room has been moved into a random dungeon of the game's choosing, so you never know where that same equip point will take you. Try warping to the start of the dungeon, too! Sometimes you may need to use dungeons with multiple exits, like Hyrule Castle, as a connection from one place on the map to the other, despite how jumbled the dungeon is. Keep an eye out for that. Dungeons can ask you to do some very complex paths involving the blue and orange switch puzzles. Remember which rooms contain a switch in case you need to flip it, as sometimes you have to do a whole lot of backtracking. Three more quick tips. You can see what dungeon you are currently in by looking at the upper left corner to see its respective abbreviation. If there's a boss nearby, you may see a red blinking square up near the dungeon's chest count. And finally, small keys can be very volatile in Door Randomizer, especially if playing crisscross. Sometimes it is not a bad idea to save the game before diving into a dungeon and resetting if you end up wasting too many keys on useless doors. While there are still so many small details I could get into, it is best to call it there and go over the pros and cons. So for the pros, Door Randomizer and Crisscross Cross invites utter chaos, leading to seeds that can have you telling stories for days to come. 
If you manage to remember your way around the new dungeons, it can feel highly rewarding to know your noggin's working so well. It also invites truly ridiculous amounts of replayability, as there are more variants than any other mode. But as for the cons, Door Randomizer can be incredibly confusing, especially when mixed with other modes. Be sure you're ready to solve quite the puzzle if you choose to play it. This mode is difficult to even set up in the first place, as it requires an external program and having the correct Python dependencies installed. There are currently no good trackers for the randomized dungeons just yet, so you'll have to remember them either by taking notes or memorizing them, though I'm sure there will be trackers in time. The seeds themselves will drag on longer than most other modes, just due to the sheer complexity of them. And of course, SMALL KEYS! A crisscross story. I know it was a long time coming, but that about wraps up the more commonly played modes and presets for the Link to the Fast randomizer. My hope is that the information provided will help you decide what mode best suits your own interest, as well as helps you feel a little more comfortable with trying out a new mode or two. You do not have to feel obligated to play a certain way. There are plenty of options, so mix and match them to find something that works for you. For now, however, I do want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you again for the next presentation. Until then, take care!